again, you know, going back to like, why did I choose real estate? You know, I was still clinging on to the RV lifestyle, you know? So it's like, for me, it was if I could get our house hack to be basically cheaper or the same as what we were paying to live in our RV, you know, we would pull the trigger. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach, and this is the show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Whether you're a first-time listener or a long-time listener, it's always an honor to have you back for another episode. The title of today's episode is Meet the Dirtbag Hiker Who Just Bought Two Duplexes in Montana. This is an interview with Joe Jimenez. I met Joe through him taking my course, Real Estate Deal School. He's also been a teaching assistant in that course with me. Uh, he went, took it about a year and a half ago. And this interview with him talks about his journey from beginning as a civil engineer and right in the middle of the Great Recession, 2011, didn't have a lot of good job prospects. And so he took off and started hiking. Actually, he was a through hiker on the Appalachian Trail. And I really resonated with him and this outdoor ethic and the frugality of just having everything on your back and just the freedom that gives you. It's a great metaphor for a lot of other things we talk about in finance and investing. But we talk about that journey, how that made an impact on him and how he's kind of taken those values and that experience of being on the trail and integrated that into his finances and the fire movement and being frugal and saving money and ultimately living in uh, alternative type housing situations. He and his wife lived in an RV and then now they've gotten into the real estate investing game and have bought a couple properties in a perfect location for them right near Glacier National Park. And he's turned those into a house hack in one case. Another one's going to be a long-term rental and he's going to do some Airbnb as well. So we talk about all those details, what his journey was like, where he came up with the money, how he's able to put those deals in motion. He was living in one state in Florida, buying a property across the country in Montana. So all of those nitty gritty details that are helpful to you when you're buying your own properties and you're learning about your own journey. That's what we go over in this interview. And I think you'll enjoy it as much as I did. Now, before we get to the interview, it's time for my weekly behind the scenes segment where I share a short snippet of what's going on with me with my real estate investing finances or business behind the scenes. So today I want to actually talk about something real estate related with my market here in Clemson, South Carolina, and also a little bit this common theme with the interviewee today, Joe Jimenez, who lives in Kalispell, Montana. And the idea is this, that a lot of you are looking for target markets to buy rental properties. And the common theme, a lot of people, a lot of big, huge investors from Wall Street and that sort of thing, focus on locations that are in major metropolitan areas. And that makes sense because you have to follow the jobs, right? There's a lot of jobs, there's a lot of industry, a lot of diversity of economy in an Atlanta, in a LA, in a San Francisco, a New York, a Washington DC, a Miami. And that, so it makes sense to start there. But my tip here is something that I've discovered living in a small town in but kind of close to the metropolitan areas. I'm in Clemson, South Carolina. Clemson has a major university. So it's about 25,000 people, students who go to school there. There's also faculty members, but it's a tiny little town. There's only 15,000 people in the town. We have a couple towns next to us, Pendleton and Central. They probably make us like a 20 to 25,000 person, little micropolitan type area. And it reminded me also of our the person I'm interviewing today, Joe. He lives in Kalispell, Montana, which has Glacier National Park, has a lot of other attractions nearby, outdoor attractions, which is similar to our area, the upstate of South Carolina. And the thing I want to, the advice I want to give you is if you're looking for good opportunities to buy, good markets to buy in, I have found for us as small and mighty investors, going to these smaller locations, this medium sized cities, the small cities are much more of a target rich environment for us because sometimes they're off the radar of the big, huge companies who have to have volume, who have to go to the big cities. And yet if you find, so you go to these smaller towns and you still want to have jobs, you still want to have something that can, uh, you can rent properties to, somebody's going to work, somebody's going to buy properties. And so you look for things that are like major amenities. So in my area, the university is a major amenity. You have to make a bet whether you think the university is going to be here for a long time. But also you have people retiring here. There's lakes nearby. There's outdoor tourism. And so there, the, there's a different kind of economy and a different attraction that can then um, fuel your real estate investing as well. Kalispell, Montana, I've got to know that area pretty well through Joe. And it's an area that has a lot of tourism for Glacier National Park, has other outdoor tourism, uh, winter skiing, things like that. And then also just people setting up shop and living there just for the lifestyle of being in that place. So that's my tip today. Finding a target location to invest in is one of the first things I always teach. I talk a lot about it on the podcast. I teach it in my real estate deal school course. It's the number one thing. You have to have a rich soil to farm in. You have to have a rich market 
to invest in, but look off the radar a little bit. Look for smaller locations. That's has been very productive for me to do that. Also enjoyable. I love living in a place like this. If you choose to live in your investment market, uh, it's just a great lifestyle, good place to raise a family, kind of slower pace of life while also having some business opportunities. So look for some opportunities for your own little cities on the outskirts of major areas in great outdoor locations. See if you can find your investment market as well. If you like these behind the scenes segments each week, I wanna invite you to stay in touch with me beyond the podcast by checking out one of the online courses that I offer. Online courses are a way to interact with me and let me help you with your real estate investing. Some courses are available anytime and others like my premier course, Real Estate Deal School, is more of a boot camp style course where you and other students go through live with me as I help you step by step to buy your next investment property. You can get details on all these courses at coachcarson.com forward slash courses. Now let's get started with today's interview. Hey, Joe, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Chad, thanks for having me on. Yeah, this I've been looking forward to this. And just to give people some background, I, I, told, I gave a little preview of kind of how we connected and where this is coming from. But I, I just I love digging into the details of investors who are just right in the middle of deals and just you're you're doing it, you're living it. And we I, I got to know you. I knew you before just from meeting you at a conference, but got to know you really well at real estate deal school. And you've also been a TA and helped me out as a teaching assistant there. And so I would just appreciate you being willing to share your story and just kind of give people some some ideas of what, what you've been doing for the last year and a half or two buying properties. And just for people to understand kind of where you've come from, I'd love to maybe go back a little earlier and you can start wherever you feel like appropriate, but just I want to know more about where you're from and kind of what life was like before real estate investing. Thanks again, Chad, for having me on. Um, my goal is for maybe some newer investors to get a little bit of tips. If they can get one tip off of my story, that would just make everything to me. So, so just, yeah, for my story, I, you know, pretty, I grew up, you know, pretty regular, um, uh, middle-class lifestyle. I, my, I was always taught to go to school, you know, get a good degree so you can get a good job. So you wouldn't have to work so hard. And, you know, my dad and my parents, you know, they were really great that just teaching me good values. Um, so I learned really well early on, um, just to get a good education. And, um, so my background, civil engineering and, um, I graduated in 2011, which, you know, those of you that were in real estate at that time probably can remember it being probably a struggle for me. I had not a penny to my name, so it just, I wasn't anywhere near this industry. So, um, but I graduated with a degree in civil engineering with, there was nobody hiring at the time. So much less like being a newbie out of college, you know, trying to find an entry level job. So long story short, I decided to go hike the Appalachian trail and that experience literally changed my life. Um, I just, I, I mean, while I was in school, I, I was, I was thinking I was going to, you know, you know, get a good, you know, $50,000, you know, job to start out and, you know, start uh, working my way up and saving and, you know, and then, you know, I, I found myself basically it was an excuse to do something that I'd wanted to do for a while. And I'm so glad I did. Um, after I got off the trail, I struggled for a little while just trying to find, um, I guess, direction. I didn't know what I wanted to do with an experience like that. It's so different and it just throws you off your normal track. So, you know, for me, it was just trying to figure that out. I stumbled into the fire movement, which was, you know, another um, part of the story that it leads me to where I am today. And I'll stop right there. I don't know if there's anything yeah. you want to kind of like talk about. Well, yeah, I, I, me personally, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, amateur hiker compared to hiking the entire <laughs> Appalachian Trail, but I, I love hiking. I, I love I love both the literal camping and hiking. My wife and I, on our first date, we went hiking and we went camping, you know, very soon after that. So like being out in nature and hiking is near and dear to me, but I, I just, I love the the idea of hiking the Appalachian Trail and some of these ultra long trails. And I, I'm just curious if you could tell people who don't know much about that, like the, the amount of time you had to do it, what that was, what was involved in that. And then I want to I ask a follow-up question as well. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it took me four months, 13 days. And I remember that exactly. And I, and I took some zero days, what we call it was when we hike zero trail miles. Um, I took some Nero days, which is near zero. So four months, 13 days and day in the life. I mean, it's, it's probably, it's exactly what you probably think it is. Um, you know, you have everything in your backpack, you, you wake up, you eat a cliff bar or some kind of granola bar, you brush your teeth, maybe, Maybe not. <laughs> um, and then you just get ready. I mean, you just, you know, 
pack all your stuff up, pack your tent up, put in your pack, and then you start walking. And it's, I did it in 2012, um, you know, because I graduated in December and then I did it that next spring. And I, I think there were some things that are a little bit different than they are today. Um, social media wasn't as big, you know, so I'm, I'm sure you, you can definitely disconnect. And I definitely, I did at that time. It was a lot easier, I think, to disconnect. Um, but you spend a lot of time. I mean, imagine you start walking. I mean, you're up with when the sun is up. So from 6 a.m., you pack up and it doesn't take you very long to put your whole life away in your backpack. You're walking. So you spend a lot of time in your mind um, thinking about, I mean, for me, it was how, you know, I had the same thought. I mean, you just have these recurring thoughts of like, what am I going to do when I get off the trail? You know, like, what do I want my life to look like? What's important to me? You know, you, you really think about what's important out there. Um, you know, again, you know, you walk from 6 a.m. to essentially 8 p.m. And I mean, that's like, sometimes you spend like, and then you take some breaks, that's 12 hours of just being in the woods, you know, day in, day out. So, you know, you do you get into town and then you, you know, you get your little luxuries, you get a whole pizza and you eat it by yourself. And then two hours later you get another pizza and, you know, and then you get a hotel room and then binge some TV show. But like, other than that, I mean, I think what really, what, how it shaped me was it's just like taking the time to really slow down you know, um, take time with my thoughts without music or even podcasts or even audiobooks. Just, I, I made myself rules. Like I did have some audiobooks that I was listening to on the trail, but I told myself like between the, like the morning and 11 AM, like between I started walking, I would just, would just be by myself with my thoughts. And I think that was one thing that I was really happy that I did. So almost like a, a, a moving meditation, you know, like you just, it sounds like to me, like you're stuck with your thoughts for better or worse. And you have to, what, what, I imagine yeah. it's not all positive either. Right. I, mean, I imagine sometimes your, your recurring thoughts can be, can drive you crazy a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to sound too philosophical here. I mean, sometimes I literally was just singing the same song that was stuck in my head over and over, you know, and then sometimes it was just like just running numbers of something it's like, my, maybe my brain works a little weirdly, but you're right. Like, I mean, it's just in the Appalachian trail, they call it the green tunnel. Um, and they're, I mean, it's a beautiful trail. I would recommend it for everyone. It's kind of, it's where I got my start hiking. So it's near and dear to, to me. A lot of people, you know, they don't like it too much because it's like compared to some of the uh, other trails out West, there's not that great, you know, those great expansive views and it doesn't quite have the grandeur. But um, for me, it was really special because like, again, just walking through these beautiful landscapes and just like, you don't have, there's, there was just, wasn't a lot of distractions. So, and it was just really quiet. Um, and again, yeah, it was, it was, that's a good way to put it. I never heard that, um, analogy, but it's kind of like a long meditation. And I think it's cool too, that you did this at a transition point. I mean, go for context for everybody who probably remembers, but the great recessions happening, civil engineers are working on, you know, construction projects and there's not a lot of construction projects going on at that point. So just, you took advantage as, as a young person kind of transitioning your life. And you mentioned that this Appalachian trail experience and being out there impacted some of your mindsets. I'm just curious when you, you, you said you got interested in the fire movement, like ha, what, what was next for you? Like what, what were some of the, the, the things you decided after that long meditation, you know, what, what were you thinking about doing next and how did it, how did it transition from there? Yeah. Well, I kept, um, you know, leading up to the trip and even like while I was on it, I kept kind of getting this recurring theme, you know, when I would talk to maybe older people with more experience and stuff and, you know, I, I would just hear this, like, do it now while you're young, you know, or uh, it was basically that, that um, sentiment. And it just, for me, maybe I'm too stubborn, but like, it didn't quite sit right with me. You know, it was kind of like this idea that like, you know, have all the fun while you're in college or, or, you know, while you're in high school and while you're young. And then later on you grow up, get a job, work forever and you're supposed to kind of be, that's just what life is, you know, that's life. And, um, I think, um, one of my friends, uh, that he's a triple crowner. That's, uh, he's hiked all three of the U.S.'s largest, uh, that's the Appalachian trail, Pacific crest trail and continental divide trail. And, uh, he said something to me cause you know, after I got off the trail, it wasn't really quick. I don't want to just say like, I jumped off the trail, you know, and then I found fire and then I was all of a sudden I was right down the path and, you know, it took a little while. It was hard. I mean, I did a lot of 
uh, searching, studying, um, you know, I actually, I was depressed for a little while there, you know, just like, just trying to find the next thing. And eventually I did find uh, the fire movement. I'm glad I did, but my friend said that I ruined myself, you know, um, basically he's kind of saying it, you know, it's kind of a little sarcastically. It's like, but I did that experience that we're not really supposed to do, right? Like it's not normal to quit your job or graduate college and then take off for four to six months and just live in the woods, you know? A lot of people don't do that. So um, I did something that kind of changed me and I ruined myself. So after that, like I said, I searched for a long time. And um, if had I known about house hacking, that probably would have been my uh, next strategy. Because in my opinion, I think it's the best strategy to start getting, uh, to get started with real estate. But um, my idea of a house hack was living in an RV. So, you know, I presented the idea to my wife and I said, this is it. Like, you know, we can live really cheaply because I, Oftentimes when I meet friends that are into the fire movement, it's usually either they're into it and their spouses. A lot of times it's like one of the two, if you're married, you know, and for me, it was definitely me who found, you know, came up with all the ideas and was presenting it to my wife. And I would do things a little bit differently now, but <laughs> just, you get really excited, you know, and you're just like, Hey, look at this. We're going to like live off of 20% of our income and we're going to live in an RV. And, you know, and she's like, what? <laughs> so so that's what, you know, I, yeah, we just did a bunch of research and, uh, we, uh, started living in a fifth wheel in a 55 plus community in Florida. So that was our immediate start. Um, and then I really, um, resonated with, uh, everybody knows, uh, Mr. Money Mustache's, uh, blog, and he's really into, uh, cycling and, you know, kind of a lot of these things that are, uh, just like health, uh, lifestyle things, you know, like cycling is really good walking exercise. And so, um, I was biking to work every day and I was taking my lunch to work and you know, I started doing all of the, um, what I think are really important, um, frugality aspects of the fire, um, movement. Um, we were just living well within our means and, uh, that, that just created a lot of, uh, opportunities and options for us. I'm glad you brought up frugality. This is just a little side tangent, but it's related to your hiking. It's related to what you're doing there. Just mm -hmm. biking to school. Is, I, I was rereading um, the, Your Money or Your Life last night because I'm, I'm writing, nice. a book, writing a book next year, by the way, and I'm gonna I'm trying to bring in some of that concept of enough. T to me, the idea of frugality, they, they defined it in the book as not being a cheapskate, but as someone who has a really high joy to stuff ratio. And mm. what, you what you described really brought that home to me because hiking on the trail with everything on your back and living frugally early in your life and saying, I can bike to work. I can, you know, I don't have to have, a, we only have to have, we don't have to have another car. I can bike. I can get exercise out of that. I don't have to have a gym membership. Like it's not, some people would see that as hey, quote cheap, mm -hmm. and, but the way I see it and you know, obviously it's a lifestyle choice, right? But it's a, it's an exercise and practicing how much joy you can sap out a lot, you know, get out of mm -hmm. life for as little as possible. And I don't know, that seems like that's what you're doing to me. I mean, yeah. That's, that's and, and honestly, I'm, I'm surprised the like through hiking or, you know, some of the stuff that uh, just like, you know, it's become a little bit more popular, like with the van life movement and all that stuff. But I'm surprised there's so many like parallels, right? Um, you know, like I'm a, my style of hiking is a, I'm an ultra lighter, which means like, you know, you have a, just a really low base weight and, you know, I, I rarely carry more than like 20 pounds on my back with everything. And, I mean, I have really nice gear. Don't get me wrong. You know, really expensive stuff that, you know, it's, I mean, not, you're not just going to go buy tomorrow. Like it's, you know, literally thousands of dollars worth of gear. Um, but it's very limited gear. Right. And I mean, I've that little, that bit, little bit limited gear has taken me to some places that, I mean, got, uh, you know, I've hiked around New Zealand, um, you know, last 2019, I hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. And uh, like you said, like, I mean, I just got limited stuff that, you know, I really like that. You said like, you just extract a lot of value from, and I don't have a flashy car, you know, I don't have like a Tesla or, you know, an iPhone 13 or, you know, whatever the current model is right now. But um, yeah, I don't, I, I heard someone else describe it as being a valuist, you know, like I, I, I spend good money on things that I value. Um, I, I'm really careful about, I don't just, I'm really careful about the things that I do value, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm just a simple guy too. Like I don't need much to make me happy. And I think that's really 
carried over well to our investment. Like, uh, you know, we invest in uh, index funds, right? Very simple, very easy. I'm not like chasing, you know, big wins, right? You know, with all the, the latest investment strategies, um, even with, um, you know, I really like what you talk about too with the real estate is like the uh, go small or go home, you know? Uh, it, it just, it relates so well. I mean, it really resonates with me because it's like, you know, it's easy to compare ourselves with people that are doing like these crazy syndications and like have like X amount of doors or, you know, and, and to me, I just like the idea of like enough, I guess, you know, and for me, that happens to be not that much. So <laughs> yeah. maybe it's a little bit easier for me, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's what has that characteristics uh, has uh, made it a little bit easier for us to just kind of achieve some of the financial success that we have. No, no doubt about it. I love it. I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to this camping metaphor in the hiking yeah, metaphor sure. because, because it, it. It, it's so helpful. But uh, to, to your story, um, you know, you, you got off the trail. I assume at some point you got a job because you say you're, work, you're biking to work. You and your wife mm -hmm. get a, a fifth, fifth wheel trailer to kind of live inexpensively. Um, you were studying the fire movement. You're, some of these principles that you, you know, had learned just intuitively from hiking, you're applying to your life, live, live simply, save money. So you're earning money now. Like what, what was the transition for you then to start getting interested in real estate itself? To be honest, it, it took a while, right? I was the guy, like the index funds or bust guy, you know, like real estate, you know, is no, it's not a, it's a bad investment. You know, it's like, it just keeps up with inflation and all that stuff. And I think that was, that more was me just, um, being a little bit, uh, unaware of some of the benefits to real estate. And I think I had my, like, I think I was viewing real estate again, it's just the conventional way of thinking about it. Right. Like the average, well, homeowner, is, I, I was viewing real estate like, a, like as a homeowner, right? Like, yeah. So the average homeowner, they, you know, they purchased maybe one, two or three properties and it's not to me though, generally speaking. And again, it depends on what market that you live in. Those properties appreciate, they kind of keep up with inflation. Um, but I was the one that I was always saying like, no, you just need to invest in stocks and, you know, real estate is not a good investment. And before, again, like I said, I didn't, hadn't known about house hacking and, you know, some of these other techniques and strategies that, um, are very, um, just very effective for the newbie, uh, real estate investor. So that's why, like I said, we lived in an RV for seven years house hacking is another strategy that a lot of the people in the fire movement talk about. And I'd always, I kind of, you know, would kind of learn about it from a distance, but, you know, I always just thought, eh, you know, I'm not so sure about that. And, and I think a lot of that was probably limiting beliefs, right? Like I personally don't have, uh, anybody in my intermediate, like in my close family that is a real estate investor, right? So my parents don't have investment properties or, uh, I don't have any siblings or any other friends that I know closely that are real estate investors. So it's, it's always like, oh, and you know, I viewed invest real estate investing. Like the only type of real estate investing that I was like aware of was like flipping. Right. And you always hear, and remember my, like my background was, you know, graduating towards the end of 2008. There was a lot of people that got burned doing that, you know? So about the time that I would like, we were kind of, maybe we had some savings saved up or that we could purchase a house. It was kind of like, you know, it was about like, you know, let's say approaching 10 years after that. And you know, I was kind of just in the limited knowledge that I did have. It's like, okay, well, you know, real estate has its own cycles too. And I'm like, man, you know, prices keep going up and you're always, that thought is always, you know, was always in the back of my head, right? Like, you know, uh, it's not a good time to buy, you know, prices have been appreciating. So I just was just constantly just trying to push it off and avoid it and say, you know, like, no, this is not, I'm just going to continue to live in an RV. And um, for me, it was also, I, I think I, my identity was kind of wrapped around this kind of, you know, and it kind of still is, but you know, like dirt bag, you know, like through hiker, you know, uh, taking six months off and hiking trails and then living in an RV. That's really cool. And then the van life really made it like super cool and hip. And, you know, so it's like kind of, maybe I was like holding on to that a little bit and I didn't want to, you know, just like admit that like house hacking or real estate investing is a good strategy, but we met at FinCon I believe it was 2018. And, you know, I was already familiar with her content. I was like, Chad seems like one of the, you know, guys in real estate, uh, that is, uh, I would say level-headed, you know, not, you know <laughs> I think, I think there's some people in the real estate space that kind of give real estate like a kind of a bad reputation. I don't know if that makes sense, yeah. but you know, just yeah. like, 
like, yeah, you know, like got all these doors and, you know, and all this stuff. So I think I kind of like the way that you presented the material. And I think um, just after meeting you in person at FinCon, um, I started just like digging a little deeper and then realizing hmm, there might be something to this. And then at around that same time, um, cause Katie and I, my wife, uh, we always talked about wanting to move out West. And that was like, you know, I was thinking like, if we, you know, if I find a place that we could both see ourselves living, you know, we, uh, I traveled to Montana, which is where I'm at right now. And, uh, you know, my eyes were just like, just kind of, kind of looking around, seeing if, you know, what the prices were kind of running my numbers and stuff like that. And, uh, Man, pretty much that was it. You know, I, I just fell in love with this area and um, the numbers kind of worked, you know, for what we were trying to do. And I, um, my wife, Katie has a wedding planning business and it's also uh, a really good market for that here. So it was a place where she could um, really shine with her passion and with her business that was already established in Florida. And it just made sense, you know, and ultimately we just kind of had to take action, you know, make yeah. a move uh, figuratively and literally, you know, so we moved from Florida to Montana. Yeah. I, I love this part of your story, Joe, because I, I think a lot of people were in the place you're at, whether it's a year or seven years or whatever, like there, there's, it's always easy to, there's always justification for not getting into something. And sometimes it's legitimate. Other times it's like, yeah, like you said, it might just be some, some mental hurdles, but yeah, I, I like the I like the transition you made because a lot of what I do in the in the real estate deal school course is trying to give some people like a process for evaluating how to get started and how to buy the next deal. And your your first step was very personal. You're like, okay, I live in an RV. I'm happy with that. My identity is kind of there, but we also want to live out west. And so you kind of just your compass was where you wanted to live. And mm -hmm. house hacking and real estate is just a perfect way. You, you have to live somewhere. And, and so real estate is kind of that hybrid residence investment and particularly with house hacking. Totally. That's why, that's why I love it so much. You know, it's just, it's such a, we have, you have to live somewhere and it, you might as well try to make it the best investment possible. And that's, mm -hmm. that's what house hacking is. There's all sorts of different ways to do it. And so I, lo I love that you started by looking on the map saying, all right, where do Katie and I want to live? We want to live near like in Montana, near Glacier National Park, one of the most beautiful places in the entire country, outdoors, it kind of feeds our soul. And then talk to me, you mentioned that the numbers kind of worked. A lot of people struggle with that step of saying, you know, what, what can I do in this market that I'm looking at, whether I'm an out of town investor, or whether I'm a house hacker, what, what kind of things did you study in your market to make sure it was something that the strategy of house hacking could pot potentially work? Sure. Well, I will say I agree with you completely. House hacking, it's kind of like real estate investing light, you know, like, because um, I've read, you know, did a lot of research and just read a lot. And a lot of people say a house hack doesn't have to be that insanely good of a deal. Let me explain that a little bit. It's like at the end of the day, like if you're not house hacking, if you're everybody's living somewhere and, you know, they're paying something to, you know, like if assuming you were paying rent, you know, in an apartment or you were or, you, you know, were renting a house or you just were you just had your single family house that you were, you had a mortgage, right? Like you still have that payment unless you're, um, are fortunate enough to live with family or something. And if so, you better be saving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, right on. But, uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, so, and, and saving towards that house hack, but for the house hack for me, what I looked at was, uh, what were rents, you know, what, uh, and some ways that we did to find out what were, you know, kind of what we could get for the rental unit was, you know, we, we would just kind of do it the old school way. You know, we literally just looked up, you know, apartments.com and, you know, we just looked up, um, you know, two bedroom, one bath, you know, apartments or rents in Kalispell, Montana. And we would see what the going uh, rents were. So we could see kind of what, you know, we could get uh, income wise. And then we were, we, we looked at the prices of the actual properties that were listed. We just looked on the MLS, you know, we weren't doing anything crazy. Um, you know, we weren't trying to find off market deals for this first one. Cause this was our first deal, you know? Um, and I was like, well, you know, it's kind of a little trickier to pull off some of those more advanced strategies. But I said for this one, let's just look directly on the MLS. The cool thing about Montana is that the MLS is public. So you don't need to be like a realtor or anything to, to look at it. So we were just, I would find myself every single day, just like looking at properties, you know, at morning and at night, just like 
and we would see the prices and then we would run like a mortgage calculator. And there's a bunch of them online. Um, we bank rate has a good one. So we would see what our mortgage was and you know, what rents would be if we lived in one unit and rented out the other, uh, or others, if we found a larger than a two bedroom or four bedroom. And, uh, yeah, we just, we just ran the numbers that way. And as long as, so, so me, I'm kind of a nerd. And also for this to work again, you know, going back to like, why did I choose real estate? It's like, you know, I was still clinging on to the RV lifestyle, you know? So it's like, for me, it was, if I could get our house hack to be basically cheaper or the same as what we were paying to live in our RV, you know, for me, that was kind of just my own in my head. I was like, okay, that it, it's going to make sense. Obviously you have appreciation, you have mortgage pay down, you know, and some other benefits. But for me, it was just like, if our um, living um, operating living expenses were the same or less than living in the RV, that was, you know, we would pull the trigger. Yeah. So I, and I think that's very common. Like I, I think about my own experience with house hacking and others that I've helped. It's, it's It comes down first and foremost to your lifestyle expense. And if you can reduce or be the same as what you're paying somewhere else in rent or cheaper, and then you're also owning this asset that could go up in value over time. It's like short term, I'm saving money mm-hmm. or, or in the long term, I'm building wealth. Like the, the short term saving money is the that's what we can eat today. You know, so I think that's a totally. great way, great way to evaluate it. And it sounds like you were looking at like duplexes, like a two unit, a three unit. Did you also consider houses and renting out bedrooms or what, what were your criteria on the type of property that you wanted? Yeah, sure. I mean, ideally we were looking for a multifamily and for those of you um, that are new, um, you can get uh, like conventional, like owner occupied financing for anything, you know, up to four units. So basically where you, if you live in one unit, you know, anything above that would be like commercial lending, which is again, nothing too intimidating, but like, it's just a little bit easier to just get, you know, like owner occupied loans if you got your financing um, down. But yeah, so we were looking at anything, you know, duplex, triplex or quadplex. We didn't want to go the single family and rent out rooms, uh, partly because, you know, we just enjoy living by ourselves and, you know, we didn't want to have to share a fridge and, you know, like, uh, potentially a bathroom and stuff like that. So if I think me different story, you know, but um, I'm married and Katie has her, you know, uh, desires and her, you know, her needs and stuff. And, you know, we have to work together with that. And, you know, I'm very fortunate in that, uh, Katie's usually very open to my crazy ideas. And like, I mean, we lived in an RV for seven years, so, you know, um, but you know, we basically set our criteria to at least some kind of multifamily property, well, no, that's, I think that's perfect. That, it's such a good point about the compromises and the house hacking. A lot of the pushback is like, okay, my lifestyle doesn't fit that. But there, I like your point. There's there's different types of properties you can look at that fit your criteria as a couple. There's also even, I'm just going to throw out there for the people who are listening. Like, even if you can't find duplexes or triplexes in your area, one way my wife and I did a kind of quote house hack is by moving in just to a, a reasonable single family house that we didn't rent out while we lived there. But then later on, we kept that as a rental and then rented that out. So that's, that's just another option for, you know, there, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a way to turn your residence into a rental eventually if you're, if there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, so I just, totally. just want to th- uh, throw that out there that you have to match your personal criteria to the market and what's available. And for you guys, a, a small multifamily. So, so did you, um, you were looking every day on like <clears throat> apartments.com for rents and then also probably re- the realtor MLS uh, for buying properties. When did you start and how long did it take you? Or like, what was the process like to, when you decided, all right, I'm actually going to start buying this property. Cause I've, I remember when you were in the course and going through that process, but like, I think that's an interesting for people to know, like, you had the idea in your head, you're looking to the execution of that and the reality of it. I will say, I mean, I think it kind of happened a lot faster than I could have ever imagined, or at least I think so. But um, yeah, so we, because Katie and I, before we moved to Montana, we were spending our, we were snowbirds. We were uh, snowbirds in our thirties, but uh, we were spending the winters in, um, in Florida, back where we originally were from. And then we were spending the summers here and running our wedding planning business in Mon- in the summers in Montana. So after we spend our, it was, I would have been the summer of 2020. Um, we, we were driving back, back to Florida and we decided we're going to buy a property here, you know, pretty much the fall of, uh, 2020. And then we came back to Florida and I just started, I mean, I went hardcore 
you know, I just like d- dug deep into Chad's material, you know. Um, and then I actually did sign up. One of the things I did, and I and I will say this is kind of probably the best thing I did was, you know, me naturally being frugal and not wanting to spend money on, you know, certain things. Like I was like, oh no, you know, like. I really wanted to learn more and just kind of like be more effective with my learning. So for me, I struggled with like purchasing a course, you know? So for me, I think like that's one of the best things I will say that I did. And it's just like investing in my education. At the end of the day, we spent a lot of money for our college, (laughs) you know, like thousands and tens of thousands, or if we, you know, uh, trade school or anything like that, you know, we spent a lot of money doing those education. And then after we graduate, we stop. So I, took uh chad i took your course in in i think it was that spring Mm -hmm. it was i I forget the dates but and i was just while i was in the course i was looking you know and we ended up closing in april so you know yeah and it was probably if if a prop the right property would have come up sooner we would have closed a lot faster um so i mean it was just really hard to find the multifamily that we were looking for finally once we found it i mean the ball for me, I was kind of scared because we're business owners. I had quit my job probably prematurely in 2019 to go hike the Pacific Crest Trail. And we didn't have that, you know, stable, what a lot of the you know, conventional lending, they what they like to see, like a W-2 job, you know, for two years or steady income. So it was, I was nervous about the financing. And um, I was just scared to call a, a broker, you know? And I think that was another thing that I, I, I think I would just say to the listeners is, just, you really want to do something, just, just try it. Like, it's not as, it's probably not as intimidating as you're making me out to be, at least I was, you know, I was. And, um, you know, as soon as I started making calls and just like getting the ball rolling, things just started going, like going into place. I don't know if we just got lucky. I'm sure there was a little bit of luck involved, but, you know, I, I asked uh, my good friend, do you know a realtor that's investor friendly, you know, that has experience working. So I got linked up with this realtor. He was great. And then I just asked him, you know, who do you use a lot of times for financing? And he gave me a name and we started working with this woman. She was amazing. And then just from there, they would just, I just keep asking for referrals. And that's another tip that I think, you know, just after we got the ball rolling and it was pretty quick, it was a couple months. Yeah, so love it. Yeah. And I think that's kudos to you, you and Katie, that you, you had kind of a clear idea what you wanted. You, you know what you were looking, then you finally took that action. I'm curious for the, about the financing and the money, because that's always a challenge, right? You mentioned that uh, you didn't have the normal W2 income. You had this income from your business and you had good savings, you had good credit, but what, what kind of financing did you ultimately land on for this first deal? And then I want to talk about some of the numbers of that deal too. Yeah, sure. I'll just try to summarize it really quick. Um, we so we did have enough for a down payment and uh, a lot of times for um for investment properties they uh, financing they require 25 percent down like nowadays that's kind of what the norm is yeah so we had the 25 percent down um and a, another mutual friend of ours uh shout out to bradley labrie he told me you know because i was just struggling so hard to you know um so the interesting about this property was that it was already rented out. And in order to get the owner occupied financing, we would have to, I mean, of course, actually live in one of the units. And um, the leases were set to expire like halfway through, you know, owning the prop just a year. But since we weren't gonna li- move into it, uh, what is it, was it, is it three months or 60 days? Yeah, usually, like, yeah, 60 to 90 days is what I Yeah, remember. so we yeah. weren't gonna meet that checkbox. And I was just like struggling with that. You know, I was like, oh, this is the perfect property, but we wanna buy it. It's a, you know, we're going to move into it maybe six months later after the lease, one of the leases expire. But so Bradley suggested that I just, why don't I just buy it as an investment loan? So this property instead of, so essentially we bought a, just a, an investing uh, investment property before we bought our primary or even a house, a true house hack. So we bought the property with 25% down, which required us saving, you know, quite a bit of money. And we, put the down payment down. And another cool thing, I think this is something that I didn't know was even a thing. Uh, we found a really good broker who she approved us. She didn't even use our uh, self-employment income. She approved us with our retirement savings um, to get us approved for the loan. I'm not sure if we talked about that, Chad, but mm-hmm. that was another kind of quirky 
a, a cool thing because I had um, gone to a credit union to try to you know use a local bank because I knew our situation was a bit different. And they, uh, you know, after some, you know, back and forth, they eventually just told us that they couldn't help us out. And I found this broker through the, my agent. And she basically, since we already, from all the fire stuff, you know, from biking to work and, you know, maxing out my 401k for, you know, those years, we had like enough in our retirement savings to get us approved for this investment loan. So that's what we did for the first one. Cool. And what, just to give people a context of the price ranges, like how much was the price of the property? It was a duplex. And then how much did you have to put? So we can figure, we can kind of back into that 25% number to see how much you had to save up. Sure. Yeah. So it was listed for 350 and this is going to be shot. I thought it was a little bit underpriced, but we actually uh, closed for 386,000. So 31 K above asking. So pretty wild. I know it sounds crazy. I ran my numbers and it worked. And I found out that ours wasn't even the highest dollar amount. And then we can get into like maybe why my offer was accepted over the people that had higher dollar amounts. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about that. That's great. So, yeah. So we got it for 386. um, And I think the best thing that Katie and I did was we had our, our agent call the listing agent and talk to and ask, literally ask the sellers like, Hey, you know, we, we're going to put a strong offer. We're pre-approved, you know, basically like just preemptively telling them like, be prepared for our offer, but also is there anything else that you guys would like um, other than just more money? <laughs> Cause you know, everybody's selling their house, you know, people want to sell at the highest that they can, but we found out that they had, um, so the property was already rented out to, to two tenants, two separate tenants. And they, the owners, the sellers, they had their stuff stored in the basement and in the detached garage. So they were going through a ter- transition, a move. Uh, ironically, they were also, they were moving to Florida. We were moving to Montana. <laughs> there. So was, that was kind of weird. But we found out that they had stuff stored away. And in order to make the transition smoothly, they actually wanted a, like a couple more months of keeping their stuff stored. And we said, done. Like, you know, we actually we went overkill and said, you can keep it in there for a year. <laughs> just like, maybe like that could have like came back to um, bite us, but like, it was kind of just like a overkill um, offer. And another thing that we did, so we let them keep their stuff in there. It turns out that was, that ended up being kind of funny because um, when they went to remove their stuff, they only kept it in there for like three months. But then they're like, they're like having this like garage sale on our pro- on the property. <laughs> they're like selling their stuff. We're like, wait, no, we said, you know, we said you could keep your stuff in here, but like, not have a full fledged garage sale. And like we have strangers walking up and like our tenants are like, who are these people? You know? Oh, wow. So that was kind of funny, but like, that was the big thing that we did was like, let them keep their stuff stored in the basement uh, and garage. And how else would we have known that, you know, hadn't, you know, had our agent not asked the listing agent, you know, most people are always thinking like close quickly, right? Like, you know, in this case, a, a, a slower closing was advantageous for us. So I love I that. I, I love that tip because it's it's about actually. I, I just had an interview that'll I'm not sure exactly how the dates will fit out with Bradley Labrie, who our, our mutual friend, and his comment too is how much people discount the human side of real estate transactions. Mm. Obviously, these people want the most money they can get. Like that's a given, right? But there's a there's a wiggle room in there. I've, I've found with a lot of deals I've done where if you can get them there what they need financially. And you ask questions about that makes sense for them from their just life standpoint, like you did. That's so totally. smart that it, it can give you a competitive advantage because you're being, you're, it's ironic that your competitive advantage is being a human being. <laughs> you're actually yeah. listening and, and thinking like, it's not all robotic. I have the most money. I think that's such a misnomer yeah. out there in investing world that you, or any buying real estate, like being a human being, being a, a relationship focused mm-hmm. person, can be your competitive advantage in a world where sure. technology runs everything, right? I will say we also, um, you know, we also made like a little, Katie's really good with Canva. She like made like a nice little um, little one pager of, you know, our picture and kind of like sent that to the listing agent to share with the seller. And I'm pretty sure she did. And basically it was our little story. It was like, you know, we were just honest. We said, this is our first property we've ever purchased. You know, we've saved hard. We we also told them in the little printout that we lived in an RV for seven years, and you know, ironically, we ended up living behind this property in our RV for another six months. But 
as another. Well, <laughs> well, let, yeah, well, let, let's go there. I'm, so, I mean, I, I think it's fun to know the details. Like, you bought it for three eighty six, you said, right? Yeah. And you put you put your twenty five percent down, which you know goes back to those years of saving and living frugally. Like, you had some cash yeah. because you had done that. So that's that's an important precursor. Um, you you have tenants already in the property. You buy mm-hmm. this as an investment property, so that you 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 know you're not having to live like if it had been owner occupant, you would have had to move into one of these units in thirty to sixty or sixty to ninety days. Um, sure. So, how much rent were you bringing in at that point? And what do you remember what your mortgage payment was? Because that was your first objective was you wanted to be able to live somewhere that could also eventually, you know, be a, a mm-hmm. net a net win for y'all financially. Totally. And it wasn't quite it wasn't like a, you know, home run house act where the rent was completely covering the mortgage. So the mortgage was a little bit over seventeen hundred. So it was seventeen hundred bucks. And this duplex was a one of the units was a three one and an add on was a it was a one one. So, of course, you know, we were going to take one of the units and of course we were going to do the logical thing and stay in the one one, not the three one, you know, right? Because (laughs) more income. But um, so the three one was getting fifteen hundred and the one one was getting eight hundred. Okay. So twenty three hundred total. And what was your do you remember your mortgage payment, taxes and insurance, that kind of stuff? Yep. Uh, PITI all included was that was 1700 that that includes everything okay so if we our idea was to take the one one unit and then you know with the rent being 1500 for the uh three one you know we were gonna be obviously we would have to set aside for future vacancy and maintenance and some other expenses so you know we were gonna be 200 or it's gonna be you know we're gonna be having to pay 200 to live there plus setting aside, you know, 300 bucks a month, we calculated would be fair, you know, so like 500 bucks total. And I thought that's pretty good, you know, to, to live in downtown, like in a very desirable walkable area, you know, within walking distance to three breweries, coffee shops and all that. It was like our dream situation. And we, we knew we already wanted to scale a little bit past this anyway. So we knew long-term, like maybe we'll just keep this rented out. And that's exactly what we did, you know, so we, we currently still have the same tenants that we did when we closed and we plan to keep them in place. So, you know, again, it wasn't an, a home run house hack but with the idea of staying in the one one. But that's, that's another thing about real estate, too, is like you don't know once you start making deals and like finding properties like you can't you have a plan, but then you it's not exactly it's not always exactly what you think it's going to be. Right. Like, you know, and that's what I learned. I learned that really from the trail, right? Like you wake up every day and, you know, you think you're going to walk this many miles. You think you're going to do this and this is going to be my campsite. And then it rains on you all day long and, you know, or your, your water filter breaks or whatever. And you just, and I learned really quickly that like have a plan, but don't be so like tied to it that if something, I think the biggest skill you could have as a real estate investor is being adaptable and kind of flexible. So kind of what we did with this property. And yeah, I love it. I love it. You were flexible in the financing. You're flexible in your living situation again. You stayed in the RV for another period of time. And, and so let's, let's fast forward then. Like you, you, were, you were on to the house hacking idea. Even though you didn't move into this unit, you could have eventually. You could have kept it as an investment property and you still could. One of these days move back into the one one and it'll work as a house hack. But you decided to get another one. Um, mm-hmm. how, how long was it between when you bought property one and property two? And then let's tell that story as well. Yep. So we, so we lived in our, so we moved into a 21 foot mini Winnie and we parked that behind the uh, duplex, the first house. And our plan was again, just to kind of live out there throughout the summer. Then we had some traveling planned, you know, for the fall. And then we were going to just try to survive the winter in Montana somehow. I don't know, maybe just uh, rent with some friends. And then we were going to take that, that first unit, but you know, I knew we wanted to buy, like I was getting the bug, you know, the real estate bugs. And I'm like, if we could find a property that works, we'll do that. So, you know, I was just still searching, nothing really met our criteria, but finally in, before we took, uh, started traveling and this was in November of that same year. So we closed on the first one in April. And then this was in November, the same day that we flew out to fly back to Florida and visit family. We toured this house, toured this duplex I'm sitting in right now. And we saw one of the unit. We didn't even see the other unit. <laughs> we just saw one unit 
and we put in an offer basically while we were in a plane <laughs> and uh, we were, it was a long closing period, but uh, we ended up closing January of 2022 of this year, last month. So uh, basically, yeah, April, 2021 to January, 2022 was the time. And I, I, even me, I'm still just trying to wrap my head. Like, you know, we went like seven years without, you know, like uh, I'm not going to, you know, invest in real estate to like, less than 12 months having two properties and we may be closing on a third here or who knows, but yeah. And so I, I, it's just, it's it, crazy. It is, yeah. It is amazing. The snowball of how that happened. Like in one year, you know, you, you made that decision though, you know, you made that, you put your foot down and you said, let's do this. And you took that step and then um, you, you built your foundation of knowledge. You got your confidence through your team. You, you started, you know, surrounding yourself with people and then you, you had a, you had a strategy. And I, that's what I, I love about your story too, Joe, is that, you know, on your first few deals, like and this might be all you need, really, just a few deals. If you're focused, like you had this focus on a, a certain market, a certain type of deal, that allows you to specialize in the financing you have. It allows you to specialize in the types of properties. And so then when you when you focus that much, then things start happening. That's just been my experience is that totally. that, that really helps you. Whereas if you were diffused out and you had, oh, I'll do this house strategy, I'll do this strategy, I'll go to this town or this town, I just want a good deal mm -hmm. somewhere. No, no, you got to like actually you did that. You were like a laser beam yeah. focus. And because of that, I think you, even in a competitive market, you were able to make some, yeah. some strides. There was 15 offers on our first duplex, supposedly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for us, I mean, it was maybe by necessity, right? Because there are people that do it and man, they're amazingly hardcore that live in uh, RVs in the winter here in Montana. I think we could have done it, <laughs> 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 but it was, but I don't would not really have wanted to have done that, but um, but it, for us it was yeah it was it was a little bit of necessity, right? It's like you know winter's coming, you know, and we are not going to live in this RV, and so you know we we're looking at proper, and you know we made sure we weren't going to buy like just force ourselves into a deal, right? You know, it's like having our criteria, and you know running our numbers like you said, and just having our strategy down, and just being ready. And yeah, being ready to make an offer and, and, and just having your, your people know, like your agent, you know, my agent, he knew like, we're looking for a multifamily, you know, around this, you know, we had our criteria really defined. And I think that really helped, you know, like w there was a bunch of stuff that came on the market. Like looking at the MLS is dangerous because you see a lot of stuff, right? You know, it's like, oh, that would be kind of cool. Like, look at this house. Like we can, we could, hey, Katie, how about our first flip? You know, and it's like, you know, it's like the shiny object syndrome. But to me, I, I just didn't even we're like nope this is not what we need right now we need a place to live and um you know it, it, trust me i mean i could have i would have loved to have had a quadplex you know but it just that wasn't available maybe down the road but you know that's, that's the opposite so it's, it's where your necessity met your opportunity so you had to get a place to live and so here you are living in your first real home, like with a roof, <laughs> roof over your head in, in many years. It's weird. I, I, it is weird. Yeah. And uh, so t tell me the numbers on this one. I know people will be curious about like what you paid for it and what the rent is at this property. Yeah. And again, this is another one where it's not like amazing either, um, but it works for what we were trying to do. Um, but the purchase price was for this one was 440 K. And for this one, since we are actually going to be living in one unit, uh, we were able to get the, you know, excuse me, uh, get the conventional financing. So, you know, we, yeah, so we put down 20% in this case. Um, I guess we, there are some ways to put down less money, but, you know, in our case, we had the, you know, additional finance, you know, the, the 20%. So we did went that route and got conventional financing with pretty favorable terms since we're you know, rates are pretty low at this time and we're talking um, historically low. So we got a pretty good rate um, and our mortgage on this one is nineteen hundred and both units are two two. And again, originally we the numbers wouldn't work renting it out just as a normal unfurnished long term rental. So I talked to my friend who he has three properties. And he actually rents them out like furnished rentals, like midterm, like, you know, three to six month to maybe nine month leases. And he can get a little bit more and he gets, uh, you know, a lot of times they're traveling professionals. So he gets a pretty good rental amount and they're happy because it's furnished. They're not going to be here for very long. 
And so that was our strategy when we were looking at this property. Got it. So you had your your nineteen hundred dollar per month payment is PITI. That's like principal interest and your taxes and insurance. So you, know, you might you might have some maintenance and stuff above that, but that's your core cost is nineteen hundred bucks. You're living in one side and then you're setting up the other side, or is the other side already rented, or is that one? No. So yeah. now, so we're living in the unit that the the one that we're gonna long term that we're gonna stay in after the unit I'm in right now is the unit that's gonna be a rental, and then we're okay. gonna. When we finish this one, we're going to move into the other one and get back to work, <laughs> start over. Yeah. So, but we, um, just after kind of, we're in a really good area. We get a lot of, um, travelers, a lot of tourists and stuff. Um, and it's a, it, we're, uh, less than 10 minutes from the airport here. We're 20 minutes from a ski resort town. We're another 20 minutes from beautiful Flathead Lake. And we're like 35 minutes from Glacier National Park. So it, it's a perfect location. And we just, just with more research, I realized this would be a great uh, property and it's also zoned for it to do short-term rentals, or, you know, Airbnb, VRBO um, type. And we're new to this. So, I mean, I've been digging deep uh, into learning about uh, short-term rentals, but we should be able to do, I mean, almost double what I anticipated, you know, renting it out as just a normal furnished, you know, on like, you know, midterm leases. So pretty what, excited. What, what are your guesses on that, on the, on the amount of rent you probably could get from the short term rental? Easily, probably grossing four to 5,000 a month. That's gross. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a little while until we figure out, you know, I'm kind of, it's harder to run the numbers, um, you know, expenses, right. We're going to obviously have, you know, we'll have the utilities we'll have to pay for, you know, we're going to have like, uh, supplies right like furnishing you know toilet paper and soap <laughs> yeah. and other things like that but you know other than that like we plan to self-manage and stuff so we're still kind of we're going to be another cool thing is as a house hack we're going to be right next door and you know if there any are any crazy issues um, we should be able to handle those pretty relatively easily and hopefully inexpensively because we'll probably be the ones handling them at least to start with yeah. before you know and moving it over to a property manager or something like that. We'll see. Yeah, it's, it's a beautiful strategy. I mean, you, you bought it as if you could do it a long term rental. And I think you said maybe what 1500 to 2000 bucks would be the rent if you just did a long is that right? Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Long, long term rental. So you're, you're looking at I'll do a little bit I'll, I'll use a different strategy short term rentals, because my market warrants it because the zoning's there to try to potentially maybe double that maybe more. And, and so this this one deal could turn into a little part-time job, which you can really systematize your short-term rentals and get yeah. it. But th this could pay for, you know, a big chunk of your living expenses plus your other rental you have too. Maybe you do one mm -hmm. more of these. Like I'm just like look, looking yeah. at the future here. I mean, this just two or three properties you could have, you know, four or five thousand bucks a month coming in. Exactly. That could help help support your your overhead. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's kind of where we're at. Um, like I said, uh, I really love your idea of, you know. I, it's, it's easy to just like really kind of get into it and say, Oh man, I want to buy all these properties. And then you go to these like our uh, real estate meetups and then you, you kind of like see other people like just, you know, just really crushing it. Right. Like, and, and it's kind of easy to just kind of be like, man, like I want to like get all these properties, but I'm, I'm a simple guy, you know, and it kind of goes back to the trail analogy again. It's like, you know, I like if I can accomplish, you know, our, if we can accomplish our goals with less properties, the better, I think, because as we start to get more properties, life's going to get a little bit more complicated. You know, there's just more, more stress <laughs> and just more, more tenants. And I know obviously you would, we put systems in place to kind of manage those, but even just for me as a, as an ultralighter, as a minimalist, as a former RVer, right? Like all those things are just like small and easy and simple and Kind of, I do really like the idea of just you, you really don't do not need um, 50 properties if you don't want to. You know, if you do, that's awesome too. But for me, I kind of it just works the idea of just like maybe a handful of properties, and you kind of be surprised at like how much cash flow that could provide, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so many metaphors there with the ultralight, you know, you, can't, you, get, <laughs> you, you, you get too much stuff in your backpack, too much weight in your backpack. You can't, you can't get out on the trail literally because you got yeah. too much bogging you down. And, you know, big, you know, this, but a big part of my uh, lifestyle has been my wife and I traveling with our kids. And, and so 
you know, I, I've struggled with this too. Like we did get bigger. I have a business partner, so you know, everything's kind of 50, 50 there, but we, we had plenty of moment, forks in the road. Like you've had too, where we had to decide, all right, we could go buy another building. We could buy more. Like we haven't bought anything for the last, we've here and there replaced the property, but last three or four years, it's all been mm -hmm. maintaining what we have, selling off a little bit, paying off debt. And there's a part of me that's like, yeah, same as you, you go to these meetings, like, Oh, I could be doing that. I could be, but it's, it goes back to the, how we started this conversation. Like you went on the trail and realized that the lifestyle I want is to be hiking and walking. And I want to be mm -hmm. free from a day to day. And I don't want to be sitting at a desk and having these kind of jobs and working it backwards from that and saying, how many properties do I need to accomplish that? And I mean, you're, I just, I'm so happy for what you're doing. There's still some work to be done. Right. But I'm just, I'm really excited for you, Joe. And what's, the progress you've made so far in a really relatively short period of time. And also just the, all the light bulbs that I see going on in your head <laughs> and, you know, just in the, in the, the, the negotiations you've had to make, you know, between, all right, what's going to work for our life and what's not. But, um, I, I want to just, as we close this out, Joe, people are going to be hopefully inspired by what you've done and motivated and also learn something. Do you have any, any final tips that would help somebody who maybe wants to take a similar path. They either want to house hack or they just want to buy a couple properties and they're starting from scratch. What would be just any advice you you give them based on what you've done for the last year and a half or year a year? Yeah, thanks, Chad. Um, whew, yeah, I have a lot of, I can say right now, but yeah. I would say I think you you summarized it. I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say is that for me take some time for me it was I, I took some time to be you know to find out what was that i wanted in life right like i think uh it's more important it's more important now than it probably ever was with all the distractions that we have right with TikTok and you know reels and you know all the social media and all the and netflix shows and stuff i would say just you know take a little bit of time um find out you know in in, in in the fire movement, everyone says like, find out your why, right? Like, why are you doing this? You know, why are, do you want to get into real estate? Um, and just really get a clear vision of like your motivation, you know, and then every things become a lot easier once you do that. And that's it. I say that and it sounds like it's like such an easy thing to do. Trust me. It took me a while to, and I'm still figuring it out every day. Like, you know, but I think just if you can kind of figure things out, like, for yourself. And it just try to, again, we talked about like going to meetings and trying to not compare yourself to other people that are maybe further along, just kind of like find out your motivations and then figure out what you need to do to meet your goals. And I think starting there, I know that's like, not really like, at, like nuts and bolts, but I think if you can start there, I think things will become a lot easier, you know? Um, yeah, I guess that's what I'd say. I, th I think that's really good advice. I think that's the foundation of the nuts and bolts sit on top of that foundation. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? Anything no, I, else that I, came to mind from, from yeah, all that? Yeah, I had one more thing too. It's like, uh, I think it, I think we kind of grazed over a lot of, like I grazed over a lot of stuff. Like, you know, how did you get the financing? It's like, oh yeah, well, we just put down 25%. And, you know, if you're running the numbers, right? Like, or just calculating, back calculating that, it's like, that's a lot of money. You know, that's $100,000, right? So I know for, for a lot of people that, you know, it seems unattainable, um, and I would just say, like, if you're, there's other strategies, you know, there's other ways to, and we can, if anybody wants to reach out, I'm glad to nerd out over this stuff. There's other types of financing. You definitely do not need, you know, the 20% down. There's other um, loan products out there that can help new homeowners, you know, get into houses. Um, you definitely do need some level of money, right? Like you can't just, because you need cash reserves in case you, you know, now you're a, you're a landlord and if things break, you got to fix them and stuff like that. Um, but there are, I would just say, just do not feel discouraged. You know, um, it's easy to feel discouraged when you're watching all this content and people are just doing deals left and right. And so I said, I would say, don't be discouraged. Um, but also it does start with your personal finances as well. Like if you're, it's really hard to invest in real estate if you have a bunch of consumer debt, right? Like if you're living above your means or if you have a bunch of money on credit cards. So I would say like those are things that are, you can start there, like pay off high interest credit cards, um, get a little bit of savings, you know, a couple hundred bucks, start off with there. Then that'll turn into, you know, a thousand bucks. And before you know it, you have 5,000, you know, and then before you know it, you're pretty close to a down payment. 
So I would say just try everything you can do to get your personal finances in order. And then, you know, it'll, it'll make your real estate investing journey a lot easier uh, for you. So, yeah, great advice. I love it, Joe, and really appreciate you being willing to share all the details of your story. And uh, you, you know this, but I'm looking forward to coming out to Montana myself this summer and seeing some of this, this amazing, <laughs> amazing property and amazing uh, space that's out there and, and you're part of Montana. And if, if people want to stay in touch with you, what's I'm going to put links to all in anything you say in the show notes and the video description, but what's the best way to connect with you if people want to do that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, you can uh, reach out to me on Instagram. Uh, it's just Joe underscore R underscore Jimenez. And like you said, there'll be a link on there, but that's probably the easiest way. Um, yeah, please feel free to DM me. Um, I know just what I know from my simple path, that's only two properties, but, uh, you know, I love helping others and I'm kind of, I'm really passionate if you can't tell about, you know, personal finances and, you know, and fire and financial independence and stuff. So please, if anybody wants to talk about this stuff, just please reach out. You know, I'd love to talk about it. And if you want a hiking guide out here in Montana, just come on, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to, you're going to have to keep your pack lower than 20, 20 pounds and got to keep up with Joe. But, but <laughs> <laughs> nah, we can do as little or as much as you want to do. Nice. No, yeah. very, very good. Well, thank you. Thanks for your generosity. That's one of the things I, I personally love about the fire movement. The community is, is the community is the, the people you meet and the, the generosity people, people want other people to succeed. You know, we're not, you're on here volunteering your time because it would be really cool if some other people bought house sacks. And uh, so I just, I think that's, if you're, if you're new to this idea, like people are willing to share their finances, mm -hmm. they're willing to support you because like Joe said, not everybody's had a person in their family who owned real estate and we're all, we're all, all here to help each other out. So thanks. Th thanks for doing that, Joe. And thanks for your time coming on here. It's been a lot of fun and can't wait to see you in person at some point uh, relatively soon. All right. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Joe. Fun. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to this episode with Joe Jimenez. I hope you found it helpful and I hope you'll join me again next week or for the next episode. I interview another real world investor, someone who's doing house hacking in her own way though. And her story, she goes by Budget Girl. She's a fellow YouTuber and also someone who has paid off $30,000 in debt on a very low income. So using budgets and creativity and extra income sources. And then she got into real estate. She got the real estate bug a lot like Joe did. And she talks about how she in College Station, Texas, bought a duplex that reduced her housing costs down to $150 per month. She's also bought a travel trailer, an RV, and turned that into an Airbnb. So lots of fun stuff to talk about, about generating income, moving towards financial independence. Please join me again next week. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that'll help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I've not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.